It was merely a week ago that randomly, when we started recording the show, Felix was uh, Instagram stalking the account of one of our favorite friends and sort of uh, additions to the show, Jerry Falwell Jr. And, you know, we've done an episode on him in the past. We were talking about him at the beginning of last week, uh, of a, a show last week. Um, and wouldn't you know it, there is a new gigantic profile of the semi-disgraced Reverend Jerry Falwell Jr. in Vanity Fair that I would love to talk to you gentlemen about today. It's like it's like Felix summoned it in yeah, the Yeah, I mean, everyone was... I don't even know why I was like wanting to talk about him that day. He didn't even he's like one of those people who only posts like once a month and he's like definitely not on stories. He probably has stories on his Finsta. He definitely has one of those. But like <laughs> he might have yeah, like close friends. No, he definitely has close friends. But it was like he definitely like I don't I just felt him. I felt him in the air. I felt him like he was behind me, breathing on my neck. And I just wanted to go to his page and like to breathing yeah. through his mouth. Yeah, breathing through his on mouth on my neck with like uh, some some type of disgusting cocktail that uses like Amstel as a mixer, uh, just like seeping <laughs> through his pores. And I was wondering why I felt his presence so much that day, but it, it turns out it's because he was about to rejoin us. He was about to become a part of our lives again with this profile. Well, I'm so happy that um, he's walked back into all of our lives because, you know, I mean, we, we've discussed the, um, his sort of uh, semi-infamy, his sort of uh, his fall from grace um, as a former president of Liberty University, now, now sort of ex-president of Liberty University. But I got to say, uh, this story really does feature um, all areas of Chapo expertise and interest in that it's got, it, it's really a profile of, how should I say, uh, of a, of a swagged out shorty who's quirked up with its <laughs> sexual style. We've got we got we got we got a swag king. We also have the bizarre mutant form of Christianity that is American Protestantism. And we've also got um deucing chambers, wife swapping, and cuckoldry. So it's got something this story has something for everyone. And I think, you know, I think I think the there's a lot to analyze here. It's a very a very long article. So I uh, shall we just dive in to the the life and times of it. Jerry Falwell Jr. Let's do it. Okay, this is, this is a profile in Vanity Fair by uh, Gabriel Sherman, one of the one of their ace writers. You know, he wrote the book on uh, Fox News. So this is a uh, from from the magazine. Inside Jerry Falwell Jr.'s unlikely rise and precipitous fall at Liberty University. Subhead here says Jerry Falwell Jr. was the Trump anointing dark prince of the Christian right. Then a sex scandal rocked his marriage and ended his lucrative stewardship of the evangelical education empire founded by his father. In a series of exclusive interviews, Falwell, accompanied by his wife Becky, describes the events that led to his ouster, their fallout, and why he's finally ready to admit he never had much use for his father's church anyway. Now, uh, what I like about this is it's just, it's, Unca I mean, the, the first time we talked about Jerry Falwell Jr., we talked about how everything was just straight out of the Righteous Gemstones. But, like, the fact that they're talking to a uh, big city reporter just eerily reflects this current season of Gemstones. And I'm, I hope Gabriel Sherman doesn't end up murdered. Spoiler alert. <laughs> well, guess I'll go fuck myself, having only seen one episode. But, no, I did, I did like that they put uh, sort of the Luca Brasi of Vanity Fair on this. One of the one of the heaviest hitters because they yeah. know like, yeah, Jerry Falwell is he's lost his juice. He's never going to be back like he's not going to like they're not going to be like, oh, you can uh, you can be in charge of the evangelical movement again. But they knew that this is like this is for the fans. Well, what I like about this piece is that it says it says early on, like the, the, he's talking to Vanity Fair, you know, the godless liberal media. And basically what he's saying is like, yeah, yeah. I never believed in this shit anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just I, got, I was just uh, in the family business of yeah. church. <laughs> yeah, literally. Um, I got, I got I have to note though the um the the photo that they use to uh, look at the the head the header of this piece is uh it's just, it's just here. Let me just read the description here. It says Jerry Falwell Jr. and Becky Falwell with their dogs Chance and Sandy in a 1941 coupe they bought last year from rocker Jerry Lee Lewis. <laughs> no, yeah, because <laughs> because I, I, I was Jerry like Lee showing Lewis you guys too? pictures from their Instagram and they were having this was in like May of 2020 when like no one knew what COVID was and they were having 
it was the world's lowest IQ hangout with Jerry Lee Lewis. Where like they, they didn't like half the people were in masks, but like put over their eyes. <laughs> you know, they're paying, like just no one knew what to do. But they're with like yeah, Jerry Lee Lewis, who's a one hundred and ninety year old man. But I got, I guess he survived that and was able to. Yeah, he can't be he was killed. Able to sell Jerry too his vehicle. <laughs> I, I just like I, I mean I'm gonna try to describe. I mean like okay like that's the description, but uh, it, it, it's Jerry and his wife Becky. And they're both looking out the window of Jerry Lee Lewis's former 1941 Ford Coupe. And they are giving the camera a, what can only be described as, uh, my wife and I saw you across the bar and really liked your, your, your aesthetic and we'd like to buy you a drink. Except there are two golden retrievers looking <laughs> directly at them. <laughs> All right, let's, let's begin in the article. It says here, on the morning of August 18th, 2021, Liberty University's freshman class began arriving on campus in Lynchburg, Virginia for the start of Welcome Week. The kickoff to the fall semester had the exuberance of a pregame pep rally. An outdoor sound system blasted Gary Glitter's rock mm. anthem, Rock and Roll Number 2. <laughs> all right, all right, all <laughs> so right. Right off the bat, right off the bat. there's all, kids the, into the vibe. I didn't think, I mean... You'd think there'd be no more to juice to squeeze from this ham, but um, there's plenty of ham juice left here. Uh, so here we go. Um, student greeters in Navy Liberty t-shirts whooped and cheered when a new arrival's car pulled up to the dorms. Buildings all over the Jeffersonian-style campus were festooned with banners that read, Liberty University, 50 years of training champions for Christ. For 49 of those years, a member of the Falwell family had run Liberty the country's most influential evangelical university. But the day before orientation started, Jerry Falwell Jr., the son of the late televangelist Jerry Falwell Sr., and the school's president and, chan president and chancellor from 2007 to 2020, was nowhere near campus. He was driving a white Jeep Wrangler along a dirt road on his 500-acre farm about 20 miles west of Lynchburg. That's the tallest mountain in Virginia, he said, pointing at the Appalachian peaks rising in the distance. Ahead of us, black Angus cattle grazed in fenced, pasture, fenced pastures. At the edge of the property stood a 19th century chapel no, longer, no larger than a one-room schoolhouse. Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant both worshipped in that church on different days, Falwell says in his laconic drawl. It was the first time I met Falwell in person. Behind the wheel, the 59-year-old looked like a prosperous country lawyer turned gentleman farmer. He was dressed in a lavender polo, dark jeans, and chestnut brown leather sneakers. He, <laughs> okay, Felix, what, can I get a swag report on, on the, the uh, lavender, uh, lavender polo? polo. That's the best, um, probably the best color in the world. Uh, dark jeans. Dark so we're, jeans. We're thinking that Jerry's going with some selvage, which is, as you know, if you guys out there, you know how selvage works. That is courageous because, you know, all types of fluids and juices and stains are flying back and forth when he's out there turning up. And he's got, you know, six months before he can put those in the washer. And then wh what what color were the shoes? <laughs> it says uh, a chestnut brown leather sneaker. So, so brown he's got some leather sneakers. Probably the Christian Louboutin for men with the spiky guys. But going with brown, interesting choice. Not going with the red bottoms. I think it's pretty swagged out. I mean... We know why he's going to this church. He tries to do a seance to bring back Robert E. Lee and and <laughs> Ulysses S. Grant to deuce his wife in front of him, ghost <laughs> style. And you want to look your best, but you also want to like look relaxed. You don't want the go. You're not going to summon ghosts in like a tuxedo. You have to, you know. Yeah, you you've got money, no, but yeah. you're not like you know you're not stuck up. He's trying to he's trying to go Dan Aykroyd mode. And, and get topped yeah. off by Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah. He's having an ectoplasm well, you know, yeah. party. The motto of the school, training champions for Christ. But really, he's a champion of running trains. Training training yes. thoroughbreds for wife. Uh, okay. So it says here, um, his wolf-like ice blue eyes were the only visible signs of the feral personality that had recently cost him his job and reputation. I wouldn't. Hold on. On I'm, August 24th. Like, <laughs> did he write this line? <laughs> That's like like his feral personality. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, you know, you know. I'm just like I'm I'm just like you know. Sometimes I feel more beast than man. Sometimes it's just like I feel like I was raised by wolves. I feel like I belong in the woods. What with you know going to a foam party with my son who has my name, uh, like 
getting getting drunk and having a crackhead party on a boat, getting young men to fuck my wife, all things that a wolf would do. Yeah, wolves love watching other wolves yeah. fuck their wives. Wolves, like, did you know this, that when a wolf gets too old and can no longer foam party with other wolves, he goes out to die alone so he doesn't hold back the pack? <laughs> uh, yeah. On August 24th, 2020, Falwell resigned from Liberty in the wake of a sensational tabloid scandal that could have been dreamed up in the writer's room of the Righteous Gemstones. A former Miami pool boy named Giancarlo Gra- Granda claimed that he had a nearly seven-year affair with Falwell's wife, Becky, and that Falwell often liked to watch them have sex. Granda went on a national media tour. He gave interviews to ABC News, CNN, Reuters, Politico, and the Washington Post, and said that the Falwells began grooming him when he was in his 20s and bought his silence with luxury vacations, rides on Liberty's private jet, and an ownership stake in managing a Miami Beach hostel. (laughs) I just, uh, I'd like to pause here for a second. Uh, G- uh, Giancarlo Granda. I got to say, grooming is really one of those words like eugenics that has been drained of all meaning because I don't yeah. think you can be in your 20s and be accepting luxury gifts uh, from your deucing partner and claim that you were being groomed. I think he saw the come up and he took it. Yeah. This is, a, this is. A, you're an you're- adult. You can rent a car. You cannot yeah. be groomed. Yeah. <laughs> You're, a, you're 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 working at a pool in Miami and your name is Giancarlo Granda. You were just waiting for some rich couple to yeah, pick you this up and kind groom of, this you. This is okay? kind of like when like, you know, Zoomer men like me too women for sending tit pics. It's like, well, it's like, all right. It's you, not, why, it's why, not, why yeah. Calm down. <laughs> I like also, I remember that from the start. They, they gave him an ownership stake managing yeah, a Miami he really like hostel. He really failed the half a million it's, dollars for j- dinner with Jay-Z test. Because he could have just like been given money, but he's he's like also stupid. So he's like, oh, passive income is like the best type of income. I know a youth hostel, and he's probably he's probably lost money on it. Honestly, business is tough. So yeah, I mean, people who are staying at hostels mm-hmm. don't have any money. Yeah, can't can't be that much of a cash cow. Um, uh, it says uh, to bolster his claims, Granda revealed screenshots of FaceTime calls and text conversations with Becky. I'm not wearing any panties, she allegedly wrote Granda in one message. Falwell released a statement that acknowledged Becky and Granda's relationship, but he vehemently denied watching the tryst. <laughs> it's like, that, that's the thing. That's, that's too much. Because it's like, you know, if you're just, if you're being cuckolded, it, then like you're the aggrieved party. But if you're getting off on it, then no, that's a level of sick. That's no good. That, that, yeah, you cannot. Yeah. Uh, instead, Falwell said that he was the real victim of a fatal attraction type extortion plot after Granda demanded $2 million to keep the affair secret. Viewed in hindsight, the scandal was the combustion of a self-immolating fire that Falwell had been stoking for months, if not years. Liberty had spent the better part of 2020 lurching from one PR crisis to the next, brought on by Falwell's boorish and reckless behavior, his race-baiting, COVID-19 denials, and slavish devotion to Donald Trump. Two days after George Floyd's murder in May 2020, Falwell tweeted a picture of a COVID mask that showed a man in blackface posing with a man in a KKK hood. I do. I don't. I don't get the. What, what's the um, point being made there? I think he's like going for like a ham-fisted "I can't breathe" thing, but he's like, he's like hung over from two CE. He can't put. He just can't put the thought together. So he just, he's just like, okay, we'll like put the guy in blackface for whatever reason. Just make this as offensive as possible with no like connecting thought. Oh, I mean, it's like it's kind of emblematic of him because it's like he's not he's as offensive and like as shitty of a person and his dad, but he's not really like his heart really isn't in this part. He's into real estate flipping. Not this shit. In early August 2020, Falwell posted a photo on Instagram of himself aboard a yacht with his pants unzipped, a drink in one hand, and his other arm wrapped around a pregnant Liberty employee with her belly exposed. The controversies turned Falwell into an avatar of the rank hypocrisy, no nothingism, and toxic masculinity that explained why 81% of white evangelical Christians voted for Trump the thrice-married reality TV star who literally boasted of grabbing women by the pussy. Now, um, I'll just a little bit of a little bit of, a little bit of a little spice to add to Gabriel Sherman's reporting. I don't know why he didn't include this detail, this exonerating detail, by the way, that the uh, the photo of him with his pants unzipped, with his arm around a pregnant Liberty University employee's uh, waist. Um, he was okay. 
That seems like, Felix, that's like you yeah. said, that seems like a crackhead party. Incorrect. It was a trailer park boys party. He was pretending to be Julian. It was, you would come dressed as your favorite character from trailer park boys. He was dressed as Julian. He had the shoe polished goatee. He had the rum and Coke. And he had, a, you know, just a, you know, what, what, uh, just well, a, a trailer park it is a, around him. Yeah, I say it's a Simple crackhead as. party because the character of Julian did not, like, always had his rum and Coke, right? Didn't have his uh, fly open, like very deliberately all the time. It was not a thing about his character. Um, and then like, so my it's the interview he does when he gets in trouble for this is my, you know, we all love it. The one where he goes, I'll be a good boy. <laughs> but 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 that like the good boy line overshadows when, you know, the, the host who's like a true like at least is like holding it together to not do this in public. You know, so now evangelical is like asking him to explain it, like giving him, giving him a softball and Falwell's answer as to like why he had his fly open is like, she had to put her fly open because she was pregnant and I didn't want her to feel alone, <laughs> which is amazing. <laughs> it's an amazing answer. Well, it's, it just occurred to me the uh, the woman that he had his arm around with her pregnant belly exposed was clearly portraying the character of Randy from Trailer Park Boys. So I mean, if if you're pregnant, like that's a perfect character for you to portray at yeah. a costume party. Also, the character that like Jerry is probably no Jerry's Leahy. Damn, he should have been Leahy. He was probably like yeah. he no, was probably like he was on yeah. an email chain with all these people, and he's like, oh, we should have like a Trailer Park Boys party, uh, and everyone's just like. No one wants to tell him he should be Leahy because that's his exact life. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. He was like, I know everyone knows what character I'm gonna be, right? Julian, the the, the leader, the cool the buff leader. guy, the, the cool one, <laughs> yeah, dude. That's exactly what you're like. You're not like the, and not yeah, the weird not gay the alcoholic who has like a live-in wife fucker, <laughs> fucking weirdo. <laughs> Uh, the day Falwell resigned from Liberty, uh, <laughs> my nine eleven. I would wait a second. Hold on, hold on a second. I would. I would love to go to a Jerry Falwell Jr. Trailer Park Boys party. Oh I'd like God, to come to yeah. Cyrus. Yeah. I have a leather jacket <laughs> yeah, and a gun. To roll in with the heat. <laughs> he would like. Yeah. Uh, you like. Yeah, he's just like he sees you and he's like, you could do anything. You could fuck my wife, and it, and you're like, I haven't even like flashed the gun yet. He just says that to everyone who comes in. <laughs> okay. The day Falwell resigned from Liberty, he gave an interview to his local NPR station and invoked the uh, uh, peroration of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last, <laughs> Falwell said. <laughs> it's always good. It's always good. I mean, you know, like, I, I know the American right um, loves referencing Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech um, when they're you know, to, to justify their own racist policies. But I really like invoking Martin Luther King Jr. to, to describe, I'm free from the shackles that have stopped me from watching my wife get <laughs> fucked by pool boys. Yeah. Free at last, free at last. I'm, my, I'm for, for finally free. I'm, we're finally free again. That's what, that's what Martin Luther King was about. Like, yeah, you know, I could have at any point just said, no, I'd rather not be the head of this church college that I don't believe in, but what else am I going to do? So I just have to act like a freak until they fire me. Uh, he said he offered no other explanation for his spectacular meltdown. People inside and outside of Liberty were left asking what had caused Falwell, a married father of three, to completely self-destruct in public. He was a University of Virginia trained lawyer and a successful real estate developer. He rescued Liberty from near bankruptcy and transformed the nonprofit university into a financial powerhouse worth more than a, uh, with more than 100,000 students and a $1.7 billion endowment. Damn. Over, the course, <laughs> over the course of a few months, he blew it all up. Why? I had gone to the farm to find out. After giving me the tour, Falwell parked in front of a, a handsome farmhouse. Becky was waiting at the front door in jeans, sandals, and a black t-shirt that matched her long raven hair. Okay, Gabriel Sherman here, he's really overselling it with the, um, the, the descriptions of how they're dressed and what they look like. His handsome farmhouse and her raven black hair, which matched her sandals. 
Jesus Christ. Why don't you tell her what her, why would you say what Becky's toes look like while you're at it? Is he going to get invited? Uh, yeah, to the it sounds like he's looking, well, yeah. Is, is that I, I was going to say there's a difference between impact journalism and penetration journalism. I believe he's doing the <laughs> latter right now. <laughs> A black T-shirt that matched her long raven hair. I mean, okay, so like, you, you could always tell it's like like horny writing when you're comparing someone's looks to an animal, but like sort of like his feral wolf-like eyes cast his cast their cold gaze upon me. Her flowing raven-like locks, black as night, but with just a tint of inviting splendor. Um. He goes here. Uh, she apologized about the exercise bike sitting incong- incongruously in the foyer. I tried riding it, but it killed my butt because the seat is slanted, hmm. she said as we enter. <laughs> Damn, she is like, she is like, you know when a dog like just rolls over exposing its dick or pussy when you come in the house? <laughs> That's what both of them are doing to Gabriel Sherman. Damn, dude. I'm imagining they have like, they have like a Peloton exercise bike, but it's actually a Sibian that's powered <laughs> yeah. by uh, Sykes pedaling. <laughs> no, yeah. Jerry Falwell Jr. probably accidentally invented perpetual motion while coming up with like, yeah, something like that, like a Sibian that only he can power while like another man is on it. <laughs> he like accidentally invented fu- cold fusion. I, you know, he, he was the basis for George Clooney's character <laughs> yeah. in Burn After Reading. Yeah. The gift he buys his wife or makes for his wife. Yeah. I guarantee you, in, in deep within the deucing chambers of Liberty University, they have that actual uh, the the actual prop from yeah. Burn After Reading. He bought this it. Is the from real the Coen Brothers. Creed. Jared, like he has all these like ancient <laughs> civilization, like supernatural items, like the Apple of Eden. But he's just he's just using it to like shoot rays of light <laughs> to like to like uh, illu- illuminate the the rave he's having in his deucing chamber. <laughs> Yeah, he has like he has like the the, the, the tears of Zeus, they, oh, they, and he's using it to make Molly. It's like everyone's at the phone party in his basement. They're all peeking off Molly, and he's like, "All right, I'm about to open the Ark of the Covenant. Everyone eyes closed, but you're gonna really feel this shit." Yeah, yeah. he's like, see, he's just like has every like he could take over the world with the supernatural artifacts he has, but he's just he's literally just using them for nephew parties. <laughs> Uh, he goes okay so he says I tried writing it but it, it killed my butt because the seat is slanted she said as we entered I don't know what we're going to do with it Falwell complained uh, Becky told him to drag it to the garage and disappeared down the hall I found her on the patio checking on their golden retriever Sandy who was patiently nursing a litter of four week old puppies the father a shaggy eight year old named Chance dozed on the floor he's an old lazy man Becky said A short while later, the Falwell sat in the kitchen and began to talk about the tumultuous events of the past two years. The wide-ranging conversation was one of many we had over the past eight months. What emerged as an intimate look inside inside a very public marriage, as well as a Shakespearean drama about fathers and sons and the burden of legacy. For the first time, Falwell opened up about his true spiritual beliefs and how they diverged from those of his infamous father, who co-founded the Moral Majority and waged a scorched earth cultural cultural war for four decades. When I told Falwell that many people thought he, consciously or not, wanted to destroy himself, he considered it for a moment. Subconsciously, yeah, I believe that's true, he said, nodding. It's almost like I didn't have a choice. He went on. Because of my last name, people think I'm a religious person, but I'm not. My goal was to make them realize I was not my dad. And yeah, okay, so you did that by, um, up until basically people found out that you do deucing chamber stuff with your wife, you were more than happy to uh, be in charge of a $1.7 billion endowment of the most powerful evangelical Christian university in the country, founded by your father. And then like, it, it just, it, it, it's a little... <sighs> It's it's a little just on the nose of him to just be like, yeah, I mean, like people misunderstand me. I was never into this Christianity shit, you know. Like, I was, <laughs> oh, you thought I, I was serious about that shit? <laughs> I love, yeah. yeah, I love how it's like for his entire life, like all his public facing stuff is like, oh, I'm gonna like kill AOC if she takes my burgers, and like if you, I'm gonna punish. My job is literally to punish 18 year olds for holding hands before marriage. Um, it's like we're, Donald Trump is anointed by God to stop abortion. But the moment that people like make fun of him for stuff that he does, his life is like a Gentile Noah Baumbach movie. You know, it really took me until I was 60 and everyone saw my wife get fucked to realize that I'm not my dad. Like, awesome, dude. 
Thank you. It took uh, realizing that I couldn't just literally do exactly what I wanted every moment of my life to realize <laughs> yeah. that this wasn't for me. And it's like, yeah, um, you know, like a- after after like literally accruing hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars for himself, running an empire that like, I don't know, just basically um, it was like an assembly line for driving gay teenagers mm-hmm. to commit suicide. <laughs> like his sexual hypocrisy is uh, runs afoul of the very thing that made him all this money. And then he's just like, these people are hypocrites, <laughs> yeah. y'all. That's not yeah, me. No. Yeah. I mean, I like I guess in some sense, like you you know, presumably he's just like he's he's like getting a strong supply of certified personal trainers to like come by the house. Like he is from what I can tell from his Instagram, he's him and Becky are doing what they really want to do. And you almost want to be happy for them. Right. But then you realize it's like, yeah, no, you 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 made all of your money on this. This is why this is why your deucing chamber is so big. And you and it, the most important thing. This would have never stopped if he didn't post the trailer park boys party because like that, the rumor about the pool boy, that would have just been like a rumor forever. Like there are rumors about all these fucking guys, but the people seeing how he gets down from his Instagram account, that was, you know, that, that let the cat out of the bag and you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube or can you any more than you can put the trainer back in the club. (laughs) Uh, when you think of Jerry Falwell Sr., chances are you remember him as the Falstaffian televangelist. Falstaff? That's I mean, okay, who he's okay, like? That's overriding. He, okay, fall, okay, okay, okay. Uh, he's like Falstaff in that he's a big fatso. He, in no way, in no other respect, was Jerry Falwell like Falstaff at all. Falstaff was a, 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 a boisterous sort of rapscallion and a mentor figure to Hal, but he was like a, like a nice guy. He wasn't, like, f- the tragedy is that Hal, um, um, has to like basically push away and not be friends with Falstaff anymore, and that breaks fall. Like Jerry Falwell had no heart; he was just a fatso. He was not a fun like, uh, sort of uh, rogue or a scoundrel like Falstaff was. There was no tragedy in him. He was just a fucking uh, just an the evil. The only fatso. tragedy for Jerry Falwell Senior is that yeah, his son couldn't keep it together. That's it. Everything else, he got entirely what he wanted. I mean, you, you should, Baron Harkonnen would be the, the, the better literary analog here. So it goes here, uh, the Falstaffian televangelist who never refused an opportunity to say something outrageously offensive on camera. Falwell's back catalog of homophobic, racist, and misogynistic comments is as thick as the King James Bible. In, the 1958 ser- in a 1958 sermon, Falwell inveighed against the Supreme Court's Brown v. Board of Education decision that, on paper, integrated public schools. The facilities should be separate. When God has drawn a line of distinction, we should not attempt to cross that line, Falwell said, which is funny given that his son is invoking Martin Luther King Jr. to, you know, just sort of like uh, associate himself with the moral leadership of the civil rights movement uh, with his with his what with his uh, hot wifing. Uh, I'm going to uh, just skip ahead a little bit. Uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. was born in Lynchburg on Father's Day, 1962. He was the oldest of three children. His sister, Jeannie, was born in 1964. His brother, Jonathan, arrived in 1966. As patriarch, Falwell Sr. was the son around which the family orbited. Naturally, his sons competed for his affection. It wasn't Cain and Abel, exactly, but the brother's relationship was never close. Jonathan was just constantly copying me. Whatever I did in a matter of time, he'd try to duplicate it, Jerry told me. Jonathan Falwell declined to comment. It also didn't help that the brothers' personalities were so different. Jerry was the withdrawn, rebellious one. Jonathan, the gregarious rule follower. The brothers just looked at each other as weird, a family friend said. It's ironic that Falwell Sr. was closest with his least, least outwardly religious son. My dad and I were thick as thieves. He didn't see eye to eye with Jonathan, Jerry said. Temperamentally, the two Jerrys clicked. They loved playing jackass-style pranks on people. One time, Jerry Sr. put a live baby alligator in his wife, Maisel's bathtub. She nearly fainted when she found it, recalled Meg White, Falwell Sr.'s ghostwriter. Hmm. <laughs> that's a, that's yeah, a pretty fun this prank, is, um, I gotta admit. You know who also loved pranks of this variety? Phil Spector. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it says here, um, Jerry Jr. once threw roadkill into a friend's car as it went by, causing everyone inside to scream. His favorite song for a while was London Rainwright's Dead Skunk. At Liberty, Falwell Sr. terrorized students by speeding his SUV through a crowd through crowded crosswalks. 
Jerry worried his dad was eventually run someone over, so he purchased a train horn with a compressor for his dad's SUV. Falwell Sr. loved driving around campus, blaring the deafeningly loud whistle at unsuspecting students. Okay, so this is this is just a family of yeah. sociopaths. Yeah, that's why uh, that's why Jerry doesn't really like his uh, goody two shoes son, who like actually took all the Christian shit seriously. It's like, <laughs> you fucking nerd. Yeah, like, if you're if you're if you're a patriarch, you're never really going to respect the kid who like actually follows what you tell them to do and doesn't like rebel and do their own thing a little it's bit. It's in the You're, Bible, the prodigal son. It's yeah. one it's one of the, it's one of Jesus's number yeah. one stories. Jesus yeah. It's one of his hits. Um I feel I do like that the more you actually find out about this family like the, if they like if this was in righteous gemstones. If John Goodman's character did this, they would be like, "No, this is like they're somehow like too unlikable." To be Danny McBride characters, like n- <laughs> no, this is like too much. No one yeah. would do this. The family loves um, playful misspellings of words, which they found funny and humorous. Motorcycle, Christ mass, <laughs> the rocks off with a girl. They love they love sending coded letters to newspapers. <laughs> um, Jerry's relationship with his mother was another matter. Maisel was a hardline Baptist and unsuccessfully pushed Jerry to adopt her rigid lifestyle. I wasn't someone my mom could control, Jerry said. Jerry said Jonathan became his mother's favorite son. She realized Jonathan was someone she could control. Maisel was thrilled when Jonathan later became a pastor. By the 1970s, Falwell Sr. was a national celebrity due to the popularity of his television show, The Old Time Gospel Hour. Whereas Billy Graham preached the gospel of redemption, Falwell saw himself as a field marshal in the cosmic battle between God and Satan. Jerry, then a teenager, frequently traveled with his dad to the front lines of the culture war. We'd fly around on these old DC-3s from city to city. It was like the movie Almost Mm. Famous, he recalled. I'd be the kid in the back of the auditorium selling my dad's books and records to people while he preached. I would have all all this money stuffed into my pocket. That was everyday life. This doesn't sound like the movie Almost Famous. (laughs) I love that that's the first thing he compares it to. Like, he can't... I get, you know constant theme we've been realizing is that every american is really the same like across class lines he's yeah like, yeah he's just like there's no difference between him and like at that time a kid his age who went to nyu so the, the same attitudes and same interpretations of their own life my life a movie reminded me of that movie can't hardly wait um okay so it says uh sh- uh, looking back jerry says that his father's lifestyle provided a reprieve from an oppressive hmm. marriage my good, good thing, good thing. Jerry Jr. is in a very liberated, uh, healthy marriage. It's not oppressive in the slightest. Uh, my dad wanted to travel the world as an escape. Jerry said he recalled that his mother's provincial worldview grated on his father. She wanted to live a small town preacher's life. She didn't let him mess around. Oh. Jerry said <laughs> divorce was out of the question. According to Jerry, his his dad found ways to take the edge off at home, even though Maisel never allowed alcohol in the house. Sometimes he would drink a whole bottle of NyQuil. He called it Baptist <laughs> wine, he remembered. Jerry grew up to learn that he too could have a private life that didn't align with so his So this is persona. a family... So, I mean, this is an interesting... Jerry so Falwell just, was, was on that scissor? Like, like, scissor is at least, like, expensive. Like, this is, like... That's what a 14-year-old in Idaho does when he can't find drugs. Like, this is a family of crackheads. Jerry, Jerry Falwell would take the edge off by holding his breath until he <laughs> yeah. passed out. This is like, <laughs> literally, I'm expecting the next paragraph to be like, he was addicted to whippets in the last 20 years of his life. As I walked across Liberty's quad last August, giddy freshmen lined up at information booths to register for orientation week. Orientation week events like passengers on a pleasure cruise, albeit a wholesome one. Liberty's strict code of conduct, known as the Liberty Way, forbids students from drinking, <laughs> attending dances, or being alone in a room with a member of the opposite sex. <laughs> it says nothing about cough medicine, though. Um, students can be fined $250 if they are caught attending events where alcohol is served. So there were nightly jazz concerts, bingo, and movie screenings. The student union had a bowling alley, ping pong tables, and a video game room, and a creation museum. Students could even ski on a year-round slope cut into the 1,300-foot mountain behind the campus. The theme park amenities were Jerry's vision. I'm not an artist, but for me, planning and developing the campus was my art, Jerry told me as we sat in his kitchen. 
uh, Jerry was at a spiritual crossroads. He didn't want to be a fundamentalist, but he wasn't an atheist either. Jerry said he majored in religious studies at Liberty so he could figure out what he really believed. It was during a course on apologetics, the studying of defending Christianity to non-believers, that Jerry said he was persuaded it was rational to believe Jesus was literally the Son of God and that the miracles of the Bible happened. I became a true Christian in college, Jerry told me. Newly confident in his faith, Jerry decided believing in Christ didn't mean he had to follow the evangelical rules. After all, Jesus was a rule breaker too. Organized religion says you have to earn your way to heaven. What Jesus said was, you just have to believe, he said. For graduate school, Jerry was determined to escape the fundamentalist fishbowl of Lynchburg. In the fall of 1984, he entered the University of Virginia Law School 70 miles north in Charlottesville. It was Jerry's first time living away from home, and he could freely lead an outwardly secular life. He never bothered to join a church. If religion came up, he'd say, that's not me, that's my dad. UVA classmate David Friedman recalled, he was a normal guy. Classmate Tom Angelo said, we played pickup basketball. He'd go to happy hour. One of his UVA classmates was John Hornsby, the younger brother of singer-songwriter Bruce Hornsby. One of the songs Bruce wrote had a few lyrics about a fat man selling salvation, Jerry recalled. Jerry said he laughed when he heard it. Uh, Matt, what do you make of um, uh, his, his, his conception of religion that uh, organized religion essentially demands that you follow rules and earn your way into heaven? But what Jesus said is that, hey, I'm a rule maker too, and you just got to believe. Uh, yeah, it's, it's what you do when you don't have a society or a civilization, and you got to uh, make, uh, make your own way as you go. And uh, you can either apply some sort of rigorous, uh, you know, rule or, or model for your own life, or you can just uh, do what you want to do and then call it uh, what God wants. And who isn't going to take that offer when it's really all we, all you've got? It's the only option really yeah, on the table. It sounds like he didn't, you know, have trouble picking up Protestantism. It sounds like he, he figured it out very easily. He totally yeah. absorbed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, he's like the Neo of it. Yeah, he got it at like a cellular level. I mean, it seems like his dad was more interested in at least appearing outwardly to follow the rules of his religion. But then he was finding like, like Jerry Falwell Sr. would probably never have gone to a happy hour or be seen, you know, canoodling or, you know, getting drunk or listening to, to rock music that made fun of him or whatever. But at the same time, it's like all, all of his, all of his like, I'm going to do whatever I want and break rules just just sort of manifested in even weirder ways, like trying to hit students with your car, blowing an air horn at them. or getting He was, fucked no, up he was the first <laughs> Protestant Jew. He's like, no, he OK, like, let me explain. <laughs> He's, He's like, doing all like the Protestant things. He approaches his life like a Protestant and interprets himself as the protagonist in the way that a pro American Protestant does. But he also is doing the Jewish thing of like. You need all these rules, like rules are make sense of the chaos. It's sort of the only way we can really make it through life. But also the point of having rules is so you can find creative ways to not really break them. Wait a second. Wait a second. So like th this, this, this informs Jerry Falwell Jr.'s yes. hot wifing. It's like Giancarlo yes. is just like a Shabbos guy. <laughs> it's like on Saturdays I can't fuck my wife, oh my so God. I need you to come over. And we and thought take Jerry care Jr. was stupid. No, they they started a new thing. This is <laughs> oh man, you know how in like in Dune they're like oh the Orange Catholic Bible because it's like so far in the future yeah, that yeah, things yeah. merge. That's what like when the real Dune happens, ten thousand years after we're all dead, it's gonna be like okay, all rise for the Protestant Jewish sermon. That's gonna be the only space religion. <laughs> All, all, all yeah. wives, all wives, all wives. Uh, we're hey, House Harkonnen is hosting a Christian Seder. Everyone's invited. <laughs> it's finally happening. We're finally having Christian Seder. Yeah, no, this is this is the thing that's going to bring America back during the age of space colonialism. Okay, moving on. It says here on a visit during his second on a visit home during his second year of law school. Jerry ran into a vivacious Liberty freshman named Becky, Be named Becky Tilly. Jerry attended Liberty's uh, with Becky's older sister, and he first met Becky when she was 13. Mm. Jerry was now 23, and Becky was 18. For their first date, Jerry took Becky to a drive-in to see The Terminator, rated R, by the way. They fell in love. Becky dropped out of Liberty after her freshman year and got a waitressing job in Lynchburg. She stayed with Jerry in Charlottesville on her days off. 
He had a motorcycle up there, and we'd go for rides, Becky recalled. Um, taking your future wife first date to see the Terminator at a drive yeah, that's just, wonderful. It's pretty pimp, actually. Hate to say. The relationship escalated Jerry's conflict with his mother, who didn't approve of Becky's family. Maisel's objections infuriated Jerry because on paper, Becky's family checked all the boxes. Her father was a multimillionaire real estate developer, devout Baptist, and a Jerry Falwell Sr. superfan to boot. The only show Becky's dad ever watched on TV was my dad's, Jerry told me. But Becky was from North Carolina, which, from Maisel's Virginia point of view, made Becky backwards. <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> Maisel sounds uh, oh, pretty awesome. I love Maisel <laughs> Maisel The marvelous Mrs. Maisel <laughs> You know how we were talking about How it's like uh, what? Like okay like what are, what are Ukrainians and Russians really fighting about It's like you guys are doing the same stuff This is This is yeah. even farther than that It's like you know you speak the exact same language Yeah just like uh, Serbs yeah. and Croats Yeah that's right I said it <laughs> <laughs> she said you can't be dating that hick from north carolina jerry recalled jerry refused to end it i was like i don't care what you think Maisel retaliated and stopped paying jerry's living expenses jerry said his dad loved becky and he was very happy for us oh Maisel, oh Maisel. i'd I, if only you knew what everyone in up in new york city <laughs> thought of all of you it was a confusing and lonely time for jerry needing a distraction Jerry offered to help his father do research for his forthcoming autobiography. What he found was a revelation. Jerry wasn't the black sheep after all. His religious father was the aberration. The articles revealed that the Falwells descended from a long line of rabble-rousers, drunks, and non-believers. His paternal, paternal great-grandfather, Hezekiah, was an avowed atheist and dairy farmer. His paternal, uh, his, oh, his paternal great grandfather Hezekiah. His paternal grandfather Kerry was a notorious bootlegger, or as Jerry put it, the ultimate entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Jerry's great uncle Garland was an alcoholic and drug addict. During Prohibition, Kerry and Garland promoted cockfights and distributed illegal whiskey. Their brothers later got rich owning bus lines, gas stations, a nightclub, and a hotel where they kept a bear chained up for drunk tourists to wrestle. <laughs> mm. Hmm. They, yeah. I mean, that, they sound cool. They're straight mm. hustlers. This this is the real uh, secret of much of uh, America's like religious history is that it's just another fucking yeah. hustle. And I mean, it's telling that Jerry Falwell Sr. got wealthier than anyone in his family tree. So hustling religion rather than alcohol and bear wrestling. Yeah. And I'm saying like like his great grandfathers and uncles and shit sounded like they were paid in full. Yeah, they were the what they were the white Elpo and Rich. Yeah, I mean like they got their seed money selling drugs and bear wrestling and bootlegging so that they can they could own gas stations and hotels like in the next generation. Yeah. You know, it's like the Kennedy family. I mean, this is a, this is a tale as old as time. But in America, the big the big money, the big hustle is of course in your soul it's in life ever left everlasting as alpo says bears get wrestled every day b <laughs> um yeah no i uh i am interested in the atheist grandfather because he sounds like he was the first ben and jerry he was the lib <laughs> had a dare and, and had a dairy business uh, okay moving on here it says uh still jerry learned that there were fleshly motivations driving his dad's faith journey on Falwell's first visit to Park Avenue Baptist in 1949, he fell for the church's piano player, a devout auburn-haired girl named Maisel Pate. Falwell joined the congregation so that he could date her, even though Maisel was engaged to a man studying at Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri. Falwell devised a plan to sabotage the competition. He enrolled at Baptist Bible College and arranged to be roommates with Maisel's fiancé. Falwell told the fiancé he could mail his love letters to Maisel. Instead, Falwell threw the letters in the trash. Maisel broke off the engagement. Months later, Falwell and Maisel were going out. My mom's mother was terrified when my mom was dating a Falwell, Jerry said. I mean, that is so fucked up to do to someone. <laughs> he really ruined this guy's life. He said he, 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 he enrolled in a college so that he could become roommates with a guy who didn't even know he was courting the same woman and then threw out the letters he wrote to her? Psycho. That's just, yeah. A really, he was a really bad guy. Uh, looking back, Jerry said, his dad adopted militant stands against drinking and homosexuality to prove to his wife that he could be a conservative Christian. 
My mother was the only reason my dad became puritanical, Jerry said. Jerry said that his dad also knew that there was a lucrative market for such beliefs. He became a different person to build a church and a school, Jerry said. It was a point of pride for Jerry that his dad was friends with liberals like Larry Flint, Ted Kennedy, and Jesse Jackson. He didn't really judge people, Jerry said. Wait a second, his dad was friends with Larry Flint? <laughs> I mean, I guess like this is before he sued him, or I, I don't know. Well, this is probably maybe when Larry Flint was going through his weird religious yeah, maybe. moment. I don't know. Maybe don't they know. became this, friends this, after the lawsuit. Like, hey, no hard feelings. Oh, they became. Oh, okay, cool. Um, at a family dinner one night that summer, Jerry announced that he and Becky were getting married in a month. They probably thought she was pregnant. Jerry said she wasn't. Shortly after a honeymoon in Bermuda, he and Becky bought their farm in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, which put a healthy distance between him and his parents. I wanted to come out here and be on my own, Jerry said. In the summer of 1988, Falwell Sr. called Jerry into a meeting and revealed a terrible secret. Liberty was on the brink of bankruptcy. Jerry was stunned. By all accounts, the school was thriving. Enrollment was up to 4,500. Construction was starting on a 12,000-seat football stadium and a 9,547-seat basketball arena. Unbeknownst to Jerry, his father had borrowed millions to finance the breakneck expansion and had no foreseeable way to repay the loans. Revenues for the old-time gospel hour and Liberty's main funding source were plunging. The entire Christian broadcasting industry was reeling from the 1987 sex scandal that brought down televangelists Jim and Tim. Tammy Faye Baker. Falwell told Jerry he desperately needed help restructuring Liberty's debt or he would lose the university, church, and television show. Jerry took an office down at Liberty, uh, at Liberty down the hall from his dad. I just thought it was going to be part-time, Jerry said. Then he saw how deep a hole Liberty was in. Every day was survival, Jerry remembered. I was constantly on the phone with lenders and donors trying to get enough money to meet the payroll. One of the first things Jerry did was lobby his dad to pull the money-losing old-time gospel hour off the air. It was a painful concession for Falwell to give up the platform that made him famous. But he agreed. My dad didn't focus on liberty until I got there, Jerry said. Okay, so like uh, basically like uh, he turns over more and more control of the university to his sons. Uh, in the spring of 2003, Falwell asked liberty trustees, uh, Liberty's board of trustees to rewrite the bylaws and name Jerry his successor. Um, three days after Falwell's death, Jerry had to speak at Liberty's graduation in front of more than 15,000 people. I was scared to death, he said. His anxieties only grew that summer. It was the worst three months of my life. There was so much pressure on me to become somebody I wasn't. I remember, I remember waking up each day saying, how am I going to do this? Skipping ahead a little bit. Uh, Jerry distracted himself by focusing on his latest project transforming Liberty's fledgling, fledgling distance learning program into a profitable online university. Starting the 1970s, Falwell's church sold VHS tapes of sermons and Bible study courses to Christians all over the world. Jerry realized that the proliferation of high-speed internet would make it possible for Liberty to stream college courses to students anywhere. Becky, meanwhile, felt the thrill of a new opportunity in her role as Liberty's first lady. For 20 years, she'd, be a she'd been a stay-at-home mom raising three children. I would get up and watch live with Regis and Kathy Lee. That was my adult interaction, basically. The rest of the days, I'd wash clothes and cook. So, I mean, sounds like he's helping out his wife in a lot of ways. Yeah, he's a good hubbo. He's an epic hubbo. Okay, so here we go. Uh, giving ahead here. The story of an affair is a competition of narratives. Sometimes facts overlap, but just as often they diverge. It all depends on who's doing the retelling. In media interviews, Giancarlo Granda said that he first had sex with Becky while Jerry watched the day they met at the Fontainebleau Hotel Pool in Miami Beach in March 2012. It was the beginning, Granda said, of a seven-year psychodrama that culminated in Jerry's resignation. In early January, when I sought out Granda, Granda with a list of fact-checking queries for the story and the opportunity to present his version of events, he made, it, he made clear that his differed significantly from the Falwells. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, man, it's an alternate reality in that email list. He, he responded, but declined to comment further, saying he had a book deal with HarperCollins and a forthcoming streaming documentary to promote. I can assure you that everything will be answered in the book and Hulu mm. documentary he texted <laughs> Damn. me. <laughs> the next generation. This guy's a hustler. Yeah. Yeah. I learned it from yeah, watching you. He's going to start a university for like victimized 24-year-olds. <laughs> he's going to start the... Then there's more and more of them every day, apparently. Everyone's everyone's getting yeah, groomed no, now. He's... Yeah. No. It, it's, it's very Star Wars-esque. Maybe he's the real grandson of Hezekiah. 
Apart from his initial statement denying Grenda's claims, Jerry said nothing about the scandal, even after it cost him his job and reputation. I had been talking with Jerry and Becky for several months when they agreed to tell their side of the story. Jerry said the first time he learned of the affair was eight months after he and Becky met Granda. In December 2012, Becky seemed distant and melancholic for reasons Jerry couldn't figure out. I would see her crying around the house, Jerry recalled. A few days after Christmas, Jerry walked in on Becky in tears in their bathroom. He asked why she was sad. Because of the trouble I've made for you, Becky said. Jerry remembered there was a long pause. Then Becky told him she was cheating on him. Jerry had to suppress the urge to yell. Their daughter, Caroline, at the time was asleep down the hall. With who, Jerry seethed? Giancarlo, Becky said. Giancarlo? Jerry's mind flashed back to March. Grando was the 20-year-old pool boy they had met at the Fontainebleau. It was hardly a wild vacation. They had taken their three kids to Miami with the other two, the two other Lynchburg families. This group included Jerry's dentist, a devout evangelical, and a Bible study teacher from church. One afternoon at the pool, Granda struck up a conversation with Jerry and Becky while taking their food order. Granda mentioned he was working to pay for courses at Florida International University. Jerry thought Granda seemed like an ambitious college kid and wished him luck. According to Becky, Granda slipped her his cell phone number. The next day, she invited him up to see the view from their room. She said Jerry was present when Granda visited and nothing sexual happened. Jerry said she, he didn't know that Becky and Granda had been speaking constantly. I know it's very strange, Becky said, but with Jerry working all the time, I had someone I could talk to. At first, the dynamic was material. We talked about everything. I would talk about Liberty stuff and the kids, Becky recalled, but over time, the text became flirtatious. Good morning, beautiful, Grando would text. Right now, I am just missing you like crazy. Becky would text back. Becky said she felt a thrill every time she checked her phone. It's that dopamine rush. All of a sudden, this young, handsome fella starts texting you and giving you attention, and you're like, wow, this is kind of nice, she recalled. I didn't think he was that good looking, Jerry mm. told me. <laughs> <laughs> I, wore, I, know, I mean, I wouldn't kick him out of bed for eating crap. Man. <laughs> 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 Okay, uh, I mean, this is sort of the perfect story because no one's really coming off that well. Um, the Becky and Jerry acting like this was not a everyday thing or like uh, just a passion for them that they love doing. And then... Yeah, like that's that's their version of like uh, Bridge yeah, Club. And then Giancarlo acting as though he was abused. Yeah, like, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm only a grown man. <laughs> Come on, man. In August 2012, Jerry made a $4.6 million offer on a two-story commercial profit property on the scruffier east side of Miami Beach. The building housed Scruffier, huh? <laughs> the building housed the liquor store, an Italian restaurant, and a and an 120-bed hostel where dorm rooms went for $20 per night. TripAdvisor described the hostel's theme as party tropical. A sign on the front door stated, no soliciting, fundraising, politics, salesmen, religion. Now, well before this point, you might have wondered why Jerry and Becky would buy a seedy hostel with a pool attendant if they had only known a few months. Granda said it was because they were a thruple. Again, the Falwells deny this. But take the sex out, and it still shows questionable business sense on Jerry's part to invest millions in an idea hatched by a college kid. One explanation for this catastrophic error in judgment is that Jerry and Becky didn't have many close friends who weren't ultra-religious. In Miami, there were refugees from an evangelical world and were starting their social lives from scratch. Of course, having an affair and doing business with a pool attendant the same age as their kids crossed all kinds of boundaries that should have been glaringly obvious to everyone involved. Becky said she simply lost control. This new life was so different for me. In September, the wall that divided Falwell's double life came down. Jerry and Becky bought Granda plane tickets to fly to Lynchburg for a speech Trump was giving at, the Li at Liberty during the peak of Trump's racist birtherism campaign. An infamous photo from the event shows Granda shaking Trump's hand backstage as a smiling Jerry looks on. I love it. Jerry just loves smiling and looking on as Granda <laughs> does anything. <laughs> he's just he's beaming he's doing as, 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 as he, the whole time yeah it's just he's uh, pump that hand yeah harder he must have loved it because trump must have must have done the hand like the handshake alpha thing to granda because he, he he can tell a young buck when he sees oh one. yeah it's piccolo bringing in goku to fight <laughs> 
Uh, three months later, Becky told Jerry about the affair. It might have ended. It all might have ended there. Becky confessed before the hostile deal closed. Jerry and Becky could have taken a loss on the deposit, cut ties with Granda, and walked away. But Jerry insisted it was too late to cancel the deal and went ahead and invested hmm. one point eight million dollars. <laughs> once it's once it starts, it's like you can't get out of it. Becky said, "The I mean, is she talking about investing money or like the swinging lifestyle?" I mean, yeah. The more like a like. Can you think, like, if you're a 60-year-old married couple, even if you're, like, weird and annoying, you're, you don't, like, oh, we have this 24-year-old friend that we're taking to meet the president with us. And it's a not, not a sexual thing. Like, okay. <laughs> and then giving the money, like, investing the money anyway. Like, Jerry Fowell, Jerry Fowell, everyone he knows who isn't a personal trainer or like a woman he can act weird around is probably a real estate lawyer. I'd imagine it would be pretty easy for him to not invest the $1.8 million. Yeah. Uh, going on here, it says, uh, Becky told Granda that Jerry knew about them. Giancarlo is very worried Jerry or my boys mm. would beat him up, Becky said. <laughs> Granda declined to comment. <laughs> mm. <laughs> this, this this seems like they're massaging yeah. the narrative a little bit you know like uh, that was the first thing jerry wanted to do was g get his sons and nephews and beat them up <laughs> yeah they're gonna get spun by <laughs> j block um agranda apologized to jerry the next time they were all together he said i hope you're okay and i said i'm dealing with it jerry recalled the only way I, the only way i could do do it was to detach I let it go. I let it go on. I'm partly to blame. But later, the affair inspired Jerry to get back in shape to win Becky back. I was thinking maybe the reason she was lonely is because I wasn't taking care of myself, he said. Jerry hired a trainer. He lifted weights and took testosterone supplements. Jerry attributed a lot of the incendiary things he did later to side effects of the hormones. The testosterone <laughs> made me more combative, he said. <laughs> Man, dude. He's going on T. Oh, he's, he's, he's literally saying that TRT like made him racist. He's fucking aw he's okay. I, I like him. <laughs> God damn, dude. He's he's getting himbo fight. He's taking he's taking yeah. hormones to get himbo fight. He, he, he's transitioning into becoming alpha sexual. Um uh, the affair continued mm. for another year. God, over, damn. I mean, Jesus, like, I mean, so, like, I mean, I, I mean, like, whether he's watching or not, he seems like he's pretty much okay with it. I mean, which is fine. I mean, if he wasn't a billionaire off like the the most hip, the the, the most like uh, re religiously fucked up view of sexuality possible that you pitch to millions of people that will warp their minds for like the rest of their fucking lives and lead to all kinds of depression, violence, suicide, things like that. I, I, this all would be fun and cool were it not for the incalculable damage that um, his particular brand of evangelical Christianity has wrought on America's, I don't know, psychosexual ethical framework. So the affair continued another year, almost like that they, almost like they had Giancarlo on retainer. Basically, that's what it seems like to me. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, this is, again, if this was just, if this was just like a Southern real estate guy, it's like, okay, this is pretty funny, but, um, you know, you found out what he's into, but it's like, no, a uniquely evil and damaging family. Just awful, All, like awful, one of the most consequentially like terrible families for American culture and the American psyche in the last like 50 years. So the affair continued for another year. Over that summer, Jerry and Becky went to Miami and checked into the Lowe's Hotel. Jerry discovered that Becky booked a second room at the Gala Hotel for her and Granda. I paid cash, Becky recalled. Jerry confronted them outside the room. It was obvious what they were doing, he said. On another trip to Miami in the fall of 2013, Jerry said he walked into his hotel room to get his laptop and found mm. Becky and Granda having sex. <laughs> he just, this keeps happening to him. Why does this keep happening? I keep, I keep walking in on my wife having an affair with her younger lover. I just, I wish it would stop. Why don't, why do they Do keep you doing think, this to me? I think like, a, a good lie has like a little bit of the truth in it. Do you think this is like, this is kind of true. It's like he was mad at them for doing that without him, like for doing it outside of the kink where he's involved. Like this started as a kink thing and yeah. then he starts or, doing or, it, like just fucking her regular. Yeah, they yeah, were doing yeah, they start yeah. Like yeah. Sex. They start, 
they're free yeah yeah and like or it could be all part of the role playing we're like you know it's just like oh like well we're going on vacation to miami wink wink hope you don't do anything naughty and then like his discovery of it is sort of part of the thrill i can imagine that that being a a, yeah. a, a heady brew um in married life oh, so it goes here um <laughs> uh, Jerry said he walked into his hotel room to get his laptop and found Becky and Granda having sex. Mm. It was traumatizing. <laughs> oh my god! Your medication affected you. You have fucking trauma. You're getting out from under your dad's shadow. Jesus Christ! All the yeah. same shit. So okay, keep okay. This is fall of 2003. He walks in on his wife Becky and Granda having sex. It was traumatizing. In May 2014, Granda attended the wedding of Jerry and Becky's oldest son Trey. <laughs> so why do you keep it fun? why do you keep like this is this is your this is your fucking child's wedding i know if your wife is like getting a hotel room she's paying in cash so she can have like meet meet her lover or whatever but in weddings like people have to rsvp this would not exactly come as a surprise to either of them that uh this guy who's been bawling your wife and traumatizing you if, if this guy traumatized you why would you invite him to your child's wedding Maybe he has just, done just an question. accountability just asking worksheet. Questions. <laughs> uh, Becky said she stopped having sex with Granda that year because by then Granda had a serious girlfriend. I felt guilty about it. I didn't want to keep it up. So she feels guilty for Granda's girlfriend, not her husband, which is like, yeah. if that's true, People, that's awesome. you know, Elmore Leonard's thing was criminals are dumb and they will they will catch themselves. She just, yeah, she just, uh, she just blew up the whole plot in the interrogation room. Uh, this is the okay. So continue. This is the part of the story where things turn to something more like a Cohen Brothers farce. Enter the two Jesuses. In the summer of 2014, Jerry says he received an email from a Miami lawyer representing Granda's high school friend, Jesus Jesus Fernandez Jr. and his father, Jesus Sr., who said Jerry promised them a cut of the hostel deal for advising Jerry and Granda on it. Jerry denied he made any such assurances. Talk still made it. In 2015, the Fernandezes sued Jerry, Becky, and Granda in a Miami court, claiming fraud and breach of contract. Jerry and Becky panicked that the lawsuit would attract media attention. Jerry would wake up every morning and worry that my affair would come out. Both of us did. It's just horrible to have that over you, Becky told me in the kitchen, holding back tears. What Becky hadn't told Jerry was that she and Granda had made sex tapes together in a Miami hotel room. I had a big Canon camera. A couple of times I put it on the dresser and Giancarlo agreed to it, Becky told me. Granda did not comment on this specific detail. Jerry and Becky's fears only intensified that fall. Becky's lawyers were made aware that topless pictures of her were circulating among people who were party to the suit. The photos showed Becky posing on a tractor at the Falwell's farm. Jerry told me he had taken them years earlier on his phone. We were just playing around, he said. Just funning. Just misbehaving. Y'all play too much. Misbehaving. <laughs> uh, luckily for Jerry, he was friends with a guy. <laughs> luckily for Jerry, he was friends with a guy you call when someone has pictures of your half-naked wife. <laughs> Trump's mm. fixer, Michael Cohen. <laughs> Jerry and Becky first met Cohen in the spring of 2011 when Cohen, then advising Trump on a potential presidential run in 2012, invited the Falwells to a private meeting with evangelical leaders at Trump's at Trump Tower. In the hallway afterward, Jerry and B Becky mentioned to Cohen they were staying an extra day in New York because their 12-year-old daughter, Caroline, was trying to get tickets to see Justin Bieber perform live on the Today Show. Cohen got them in. We're friends for life, Jerry told Cohen. After learning of the topless photos, Cohen says he began working the phone on Jerry's behalf, threatening to involve the FBI if necessary. According to him, the parties came to an understanding. The photos never saw the light of day. Neither the Fernando... Oh, God, what a fucking tragedy. <laughs> God damn it. And, and Julian Assange is in prison. He could be doing important work, w w wiki leaking this stuff. Neither, uh, uh, no, one, uh, no one responded to comment, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so going on... It's hard to remember now, but in the early 2016 Republican primary, Ted Cruz was the leading evangelical candidate. A January 2016 Des Moines Register poll showed Cruz with a 10-point lead in Iowa and with three times more evangelical support than Trump. Cruz was a fervent evangelical himself and the son of a pastor. Cruz announced his presidential run at Liberty in March 2015. Most people assume that if Jerry endorsed the candidate in the primary, it would be Cruz. The Cruz campaign had even prepared a press release in anticipation. But five days before the Iowa caucuses, Jerry rocked the political world when he endorsed Trump. 
She, well, I mean, shit. Trump got him the, his daughter's ticket to see uh, <laughs> Justin Bieber. What did Ted Cruz ever yeah. do for him? Ted has no juice. Uh, it says here, uh, Cohen didn't need to coerce the endorsement because Jerry was already supporting Trump behind the scenes and echoing his rhetoric. Three days after the December 2nd, 2015 mass shooting in San Bernardino, California, Jerry brought a 25 caliber pistol on stage at an all school assembly. If more good people had concealed carry permits, then we could end those Muslims before mm. they walked in, he said. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Damn. Jerry also let Liberty's IT chief, John Gouger, do consulting for the Trump campaign. According to the Wall Street Journal, Gouger manipulated online polls on the Drudge Report and CNBC.com to boost Trump's popularity. Uh, Jerry said he was unaware of the specifics of Gouger's work. Cohen reportedly paid Gouger $12,000 in cash stuffed in a blue Walmart bag. Jerry told me he supported Trump because he was a real estate developer and a populist. But I also couldn't help but see that the Trump endorsement as a continuation of Jerry's rebellion against evangelical pieties. Trump drove many evangelicals crazy, including Jerry, Jerry's Ted Cruz supporting younger brother Jonathan. In October 2015, Jerry's mother died, Maisel died, which severed one of the last bonds tying Jerry and Jonathan together. Jerry endorsed Trump two months later. So, um, hold on a second. I'm just skipping ahead here. It's a very long article. Um, uh, so it says, Grando was the biggest loose end, and his relationship with the Falwells was unraveling. Becky suspected Grando was recording their calls to get dirt. We didn't think we could trust him. Jerry and Becky decided it was best to keep Granda in mm. the fold. <laughs> of course they did. Misbehaving, <laughs> running through the house with the trainer on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the idea was you keep your friends close and your yeah. enemies closer, Becky said. Mm. In the fall of 2017, Jerry wrote Granda a recommendation letter for Granda's application to Georgetown's real estate master's program. Jerry and Becky were thrilled when Granda got in. He was 27 and seemed to be moving on with his life independent of the Falwells. When Granda drove from Miami to Washington, D.C. in late August 2018, Jerry even offered to let Granda, his mom, and his sister stay on the farm to break up their trip. Jerry and Becky hoped it would be a chance to wish Granda goodbye, but according to Jerry and Becky, the visit took a harrowing turn. The morning after Granda and his family arrived at the farm, Becky said Granda texted her that the Wi-Fi in the guest house wasn't working. Becky said moments later she found Granda in her daughter Caroline's bedroom. He explained he wanted to stay there because there was internet service. Becky said the next thing she knew, Granda pushed her onto the bed. They hadn't slept together since 2014, she said, and didn't want to start again. He said he wanted to have sex, and I said, no, 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 Becky recalled. Jerry was in the shower down the hall and couldn't hear what was happening. Becky said Granda kept pressuring her. I kept saying no. I didn't want to do it, but I was scared to death of him, too, because he was still holding everything over me, so we had sex. Becky said it was over quickly. He left, and I just went in the room and cried. Granda okay, declined to comment. She's accusing Becky Granda she of rape. <laughs> like she's saying... Yeah. Hmm. Interesting family. Uh, Becky said she didn't report the traumatic experience at the time because she still felt guilty about the affair. In her mind, she deserved it. A few months later, Becky told Jerry and two lawyers about the incident. Becky said, I love that this guy, I, lo I love the idea that like Jerry Falwell Jr. is just like at least half a dozen times in this, his wife just keeps confessing that she just keeps having sex with this guy. Or in this case, uh, not none. That was an assault. That was rape. But I mean, like it, it, he just he just finds a way to just keep finding out about his wife uh, having sex with another guy. Well, I mean, but this time yeah. there are lawyers present. Like, who knows here? I don't think like the Falwells have been very truthful about everything with Granda before this. Um, but again, you have to go back. Like, why was why would you have him and his family stay over? Why does he keep doing this? Why does he keep like? Oh, I, I just want to see him off in the right way. Uh, so, yeah, um, like I said, there, there's, a, there's a lot more to this article. I mean, it gets into hit to hit to his like his firing and the feud that he has with uh, the, the, the Liberty Board. But just uh, just just getting to the end here. Um, uh, still, Jerry was feeling optimistic about the future. Even the Miami hostile investment, the source of so much of his trouble, was looking up. Shortly before I arrived at the farm, Jerry said he signed a lease for the restaurant uh, Machelena to rent more space from him. 
what used to be the hostel in Miami is now the number one rated Italian restaurant in Miami, Jerry boasted. Becky, though, has struggled. She said she's battled depression over the years and gained a significant amount of weight. They're both grateful that they still have their marriage. We're together more than any couple you will ever meet in your life, Becky said, as she sat on a stool on the kitchen island. He forgave me, and that's what Jesus teaches, forgiveness. As I was getting ready to leave the farm, I asked the Falwells if they ever thought about leaving Lynchburg and moving somewhere more socially liberal, like, say, Miami. No, we've been here for generations, Jerry said adamantly. On the wall above him hung the vintage Quaker State oil sign from his grandfather's gas station. Becky nodded and pointed to the farmland out the window. I told him I'm not leaving ever. Like my casket's going to be right over here yeah. somewhere. So there we go. That's the, um, that's the, uh, the Falwells. But um, again, I would like to uh, just reiterate here that like, uh, were this a story about anyone other than the Falwell family, I would feel bad for them that like they're you know that they have to lie about their sexual escapades as a you know as husband and wife or like that they're being extorted by a pool boy or you know like uh, just just all the lying and whatnot. But like it just, I, I would like to reiterate again that like. Every dime that he has to invest in restaurants and hostels and wife fucking has come from um, a, a demonizing like any sexual minorities, demonizing gay people, demonizing uh, unmarried people, uh, just like the the, the racism. Because I mean, people forget abortion and homosexuality were not the inciting cause for the evangel American evangelical movement. As I mentioned earlier in this, it was Brown v. Board of Education and the idea that um, public money could no longer be spent on private religious schools that um, were segregated. Yeah. And that, that's what got the American evangelical movement into politics was the end of segregation, not necessarily the acceptance of gay people or abortion in American culture. But, I mean, you know, just, uh, I mean, he, he is a swagged out player. I'll give him that. But no amount of um, trying to distance himself from his family in this article can undo the absolute evil that he represents and that he will never, ever wash himself of, no matter how many pool boys he watches fuck. Yeah, him. no. Right, but I Jesus mean, forgives him. Cl every classic car, every boat, I mean, every, every bit of shoe polish, every rum and coke, it is like, yeah, no, <laughs> it is paid for by a kid who killed himself after going to conversion therapy or a woman who was forced to carry her rapist baby to term just a deep, awful evil that this family has put everyone through for like, yeah, but Jesus 80, forgave 90 it's fine. years. It's fine though. Jesus says it's cool. Yeah. He wanted every guy to fuck his <laughs> wife and they did. <laughs> He was cool. Youth hostile, comped. <laughs> <laughs>